Arut Sheva, Israel National TV, and Or Olam, the Center for Biblical Zionism, present Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. The world only hears an Israeli voice. We want the world to hear a Jewish voice. We're all part of the same body, and that body is Israel. I chose Israel despite, in spite, because this is where God hangs up. Hashem is with us. He's protecting us. He's brought us to the land of Israel, and we are here to stay. Tuesday nights in Jerusalem are never going to be the same again. Live from the heart of Israel, welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. There's a revival happening in the land of Israel. There's a renaissance of Torah life, a renewal and a rebirth of Judaism in our homeland. In the book of Devarim, in chapter 11, the book of Deuteronomy, verse 12, it says, Israel is the land that Hashem, your God, seeks out. The eyes of Hashem, your God, are always upon it from the beginning of the year Till the year's end. So there's so many people around the world, they live in America, they live in Japan, Jews that are lost in the exile, and they say, well, God's presence is everywhere. We know that God is one, and God is everywhere, but God's presence is everywhere, and we understand that God's unity is in the whole creation. But God's eyes are on the land of Israel from the beginning of the year till the end of the year. God's presence is everywhere, but God's heart is in Israel. God's focus has always been and always will be in Israel. See, if you pay close attention to the life in Israel, God is restoring our ancient traditions. He's restoring our people back to the people we were always meant to be. What's happening in Israel isn't just exciting. It's miraculous. Never before in the history of the world has a nation been exiled from its land and after centuries returned home. Never in the history of the world has a land waited for his people to come home. Before the Jews came back to Israel, Israel was a wasteland. My grandfather, when he first came here in the early 1900s, he drained the swamps. The pioneers of Gush Katif went down to a desert and they made the desert bloom like a treasure chest being opened. Never has a land waited for its people to finally come home. Never in the history of the world has a language been revitalized. Just 60, 70 years ago, no one spoke Hebrew. The Jews in Poland, they spoke Yiddish. The Jews in Arab countries spoke Arabic. And now the Jewish children that are born here in Israel, my little boy, his mother tongue is Hebrew. Never before in the history of the world have all these miracles happened. There's an awakening right now in the land of Israel. And tonight's show is dedicated to the restoration of those Jewish traditions, the restoration to authentic Jewish clothing. So I'm walking through the streets, Times Square, New York City. Anyone familiar? I'm walking down the streets and I see a big group of probably the coolest looking black guys I've ever seen in my life. They are all Mediterranean with the tunics and the Bukharian kippahs. They looked, I imagine, like Yemenite sheiks. 
Not that I've ever seen a Yemenite sheik, but that's exactly what I imagined. <laughs> and I see them, and one comes over to me. He sees how I'm dressed. You know, I've got my tzitzit out. I've got my kippah on. And he says, say, friend, are you Jewish? <laughs> and I said, as a matter of fact, I am. And he says, let me tell you a little something. Let me give you a little teaching. One who is like a child is childish. One who is like a fool is foolish. And one who is like a Jew is Jewish. That is why you, my friend, are not really a Jew. You are Jewish. I, however, I am a Jew. <laughs> what, what was I going to say to that? I extended my hand. We shook hands. I walked away, and I've been doubting my Jewish identity ever since. <laughs> But in reality, in, in reality, there was something to what my friend in Times Square, what he had to say. And it's not just semantics. You see, we're not really Jewish. Our Judaism isn't another character or adjective that defines us. It's not like I'm Jewish and I'm an accountant and I like the color blue and I'm allergic to peanut oil and I like underwater basket weaving. It's not about that. We're Jews. It's an all-encompassing totality. It's our complete identity. It's our religion, it's our nation, it's our people, it's our culture, it's our clothing. And now that we're back in the land of Israel, we're able to reconnect with authentic Jewish clothing. And really, that's what tonight's show is about. As Jeremy said, it's about Jewish clothing. Now, don't worry, we're not going to you know, pop up a catwalk and have Hasidim modeling their strimals and strutting their stuff. It's not about that. This show is just giving a Jewish understanding of what clothing really is about. You know, in Hebrew, the word for clothing is beged, which comes from the root word boged, which means to betray. You see, Adam and Eve, they were in the Garden of Eden standing totally naked without any shame because it was so clear. It was so clear what the situation was. They were a soul, and their garment was their physical body. So there was nothing to be ashamed of. But once they violated that one decree. They betrayed the one commandment that God had given them, and they ate from the tree. Evil and doubt was infused into them, and no longer did they know. No longer do we know. What are we? Are we a soul with our physical body as our garment? Or are we just a physical body, an animal? No difference. You see, now that the Jewish people have returned to the land of Israel, our national mission should be reflected also in our clothing. Our clothing should represent to the world that there is a God who created us and gave us a soul. And that is why I am so excited to introduce our first guest tonight. His name is Reuven Prager. He is a holy Levite. He has spent decades of his life reconnecting the Jewish people to our customs and to our traditions of ancient Israel. He's the founder of Beged Ivri, which literally means Israelite garment. Welcome, Ruvain. So tell me, what is a Beged Ivri? Well, Beged Ivri, uh, for those of you who aren't Hebrew uh, speakers yet, the word Beged uh, means garment, and Ivri means Hebrew or Israelite. So Beged Ivri means Hebrew garments or Israelite garments, biblical garments. And my workshop for the last 25 years has been producing a beautiful line of biblical garments for the modern Israelite so that those of us who have returned to the land, we can begin to dress and look like we live here. Um, of course, we have uh, uh, the commandment in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verses 37 to 41, where God uh, commands Moses to bid the children of Israel to put fringes on the corners of our garments throughout our generations and to put a twist of a particular blue dye on the fringes of the corners of our garments. Now, we're all familiar with the talit, with the prayer shawl, and basically for the last 2,000 years, the way that we fulfill the commandment of fringes has been wrapped by wrapping ourselves in an artificial prayer cloth and a prayer shawl in a talit during the time of prayer and those of us who were, would wear our tzitzit during the course of the day would wear them attached to the four corners of a little garment that in Hebrew is known as the talit katan uh, which means a small talit a little four-cornered garment with holes in the corners that we would attach the fringes to and we would wear that hidden underneath our Gentile apparel but our ancestors did not fulfill the commandment of fringes with an artificial prayer shawl or an undergarment hidden underneath Gentile apparel. The way that we fulfilled the commandment was with a garment that just 
looked exactly like this. I call this a biblical talit. This is what a talit was before it became a prayer shawl or an undergarment. So Now, why did it happen, though, that the Jews used to wear a talit? Un I mean, I wear my tzitzit under my clothes. Right. What happened that it used to be like this and then we transformed into that? In the year 135, at the end of the Bar Kochba revolt, uh, the Roman Emperor Hadrian forbade us under penalty of death from fulfilling many of the commandments that were left to us after the destruction of the temple. And one of the commandments he forbade us under penalty of death from fulfilling was the commandment of tzitzit, of fringes. So in the year 135, 136, this garment became a zecher. It became a remembrance. It became a little four-cornered garment that we would attach the fringes to and hide it underneath our Gentile apparel so that we could remember the commandment of tzitzit but without getting killed for it. But because it says in the book of Numbers, you shall put fringes on the corners of your garments throughout your generations, and it's stretching the imagination to consider this a garment. A garment is something you'd put on and go out in public and consider yourself dressed, either for modesty's sake or as, as protection from the environment. So at the time that we adopted the little four-cornered undergarment, we developed a larger version, the talit gadol, the large talit, that was like, you know, pretty big that would... Uh, uh, cover our entire torso so that when we, we would meet secretly behind a locked door for a prayer service in the morning, we could wrap ourselves in a piece of cloth big enough to be considered a garment. And then at the end of the prayer service, we'd fold that up, put it in a bag, carry it out under our arms, and continue to wear this hidden underneath our Gentile apparel for the remainder of the day. But before there was the undergarment, before there was the prayer shawl, this is actually what a, what a talit was. And um, to, like in the ancient days, the, the biblical undergarment, we called it a chaluk, the Arabs called it a jalabiyah or a galabia. This white garment, this was like biblical underwear for the Middle East. Every man in the Middle East wore one of these long bell dress type of outfits. In fact, if you go visit some of our neighbors, the cousins are still walking around in these long, you know, bell dress type of Times outfits. Times Square also. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> An Israelite would distinguish ourselves by the talit that we wore over our chaluk. And this was the way that we fulfilled the commandment from the time that we received the commandment up until the Hadrianic Decree of 135. Now, it's one, you know, the first stage was to take the Jews out of the exile and to bring us back in the land. We're a free people. We're upright in, our land, upright in the land. There's no more Titus or Vespasian or Hadrian over us telling us, no, you can't fulfill the commandment. And yet, we're still, you know, the next stage is to take the exile out of us. Right? One thing to get us out of the exile, next stage, get the exile out of us. We can once again wear our garments as a beautiful outer garment. Well, so that's the question. Do you think that when... The redemption comes. The temple is built. The Jews are living as Jews in the land of Israel. We'll all be dressing like this because my wife makes me wear this tie. I don't really like wearing tie. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't want to get in between, you know, in, in between you and your wife there. But <laughs> <laughs> Just teasing. Um, I, I can tell you that in the last 25 years, it, you know, it's been a long, a long, hard struggle. In the first year, you know, I'd have to stand on my head to sell a garment. Now it's like you have to wait three months to get your order filled. Wow. You know, so it, 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 to answer your question. <laughs> You, you guys don't want garments? Is that what it is? For three months at least? You know, um, 60 years ago, they were feeding our people into ovens. And 60 years later, we're sitting in a, on, a, on a stage in Jerusalem, right, looking at a restored biblical garment that we can once again, you know, fulfill the commandment, uh, not only according to the letter, the spirit of the garment. It's a beautiful outer garment. You know, there's a verse that says, Zekeli van vehu. This is my God and, and I will glorify him. So they, they interpret that verse to mean that um, when you fulfill a commandment, you should do it as a hidor mitzvah in the most beautiful way possible. What is the example they give in the Talmud, in the Talmud uh, for, for fulfilling a commandment beautifully? Making a beautiful fringed garment. And thank God for the last 25 years, Begit Ivory has been able to, you know, produce once again a beautiful line of biblical garments, including the required biblical blue fringe. Do I have time for a real quick story? Quick story. Right? I get, you're living in Israel, right? You're in the army now, right? So I get to the induction center, I get to Tel Shomer, and I'm Mr. Biblical Garments, right? And they give me my army uniform, they expect me to fulfill the commandment on one of these little dinky things hidden underneath my army uniform. <laughs> so what did I do? I took all my army uniforms home and I redesigned them into four-cornered garments, sewed them closed in the front, opened them up on the sides. I got a, a psaka, a religious ruling that zippers are considered open even in the closed position. I found khaki-colored zippers so there wouldn't be a problem with camouflage redesigned all my uniforms into four-corner garments and tied sitsi fringes <laughs> on the corners. <laughs> Now the... Wait a minute, wow. wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I show up at the base. What do they do? They tried, they, they tried me for destroying army property. And it, and it, I did it in my court martial. I was right? just about to say, only in the Jewish state can we fulfill the commandments. <laughs> and I said in my defense, I said, destroyed it. I sanctified it to make a bracha on my uniform. <laughs> I make a blessing on my uniform when I get dressed in the morning. And they, threw, they sent me home. <laughs> they, they, they sent me home. They, like, they figured, this guy's nuts. Get rid of him before he infects anybody. And... I was the paymaster of my base. The annual financial report came due. Nobody knew how to fill out the paperwork, so they called me after 11 days saying, would you please come back and finish your army service, which I did with my tzitzit attached to the corners of my army uniform. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Ruben, thank you so much. Thanks so thank much you. for having me. The movements that are happening here in Israel are so exciting. Those that live here, we get to live it, we get to breathe it, we get to touch it, we get to see it, we get to meet it. And tonight, we want to bring those movements to you at home. And after hearing about authentic Jewish clothing, awesome. it's time to hear some authentic Jewish music. And there is no music like the music of Simcha Gluck and the Tuesday Night Live Band. Please give it up for Ruach. Tuesday Night Live. This show is dedicated to the authentic Jewish clothing. So Ari and I thought we wanted to finally show the world what the beautiful Jews of Jerusalem have to say about clothing. All these Israelis would come up to me and they said, well, what are you guys doing? You have a video camera? And I'd say, we're here to talk about Hofa'a Yehudit, about a Jewish appearance. And to see the beauty and the wisdom and the humor that comes out of the Jews of Jerusalem is something amazing. So we want you to meet the street. And now, meet the street with Ari and Jeremy. I'm walking down the street and I see Gabriel Van Jones busting a jive, busting a rhyme, and you look pretty, you look pretty cool. What do you think when you think of Jewish clothing? What do you think of? Well, you know, I guess I think, I mean, around here I think of tzitzi and big furry hats. And lots of hot black clothing on hot sunny days. 
<laughs> Can you see wearing a furry hat yourself? Not at all. Oh, not on a hot sunny day. I mean, maybe in uh, Poland in the winter time. We don't have any mitzvah to dress up as an Anju. We have a mitzvah to look original, like our, un like our ancestors. What does your clothing say about you? I'm a gangster, dude. Wait, so what does it mean to be a Jewish gangster? <laughs> Is that like a modern day Maccabee? In the eight years that I've known you, you have not changed your clothing once. Are you trying to make a statement? You're on strike? I think it's very important self-respect for a person, you know, to be clean and mesudar and uh, covered up. Modesty is important because first of all, you don't have to show whatever you have. It's, 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 only, it's not only modesty in the way of, 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 of the, the sexual way. It's modesty, first of all, you know, actually, you, let, let's take the most, most modest thing. If a person will go and will buy a special suit, if he will wear a, a very, very expensive firma of, of suit, it could be modest in one way, but it's unmodest in the other way. Mm. We shouldn't show our money on our clothes. We should show our money in the tzedakah we give, and the good deeds we do. That's the main thing. So why is it that you have a blue bandana on your head? Well, I cover my hair mostly because it's a halacha, according to the Torah, but also because it's something that shows that I'm married. And, uh, you know, if I'm walking around on the street without my hair covered, then a lot of people in the society wouldn't know that I'm married. And so one of the main reasons I do it is so people do know that. It's a constant reminder every day that there's something that's personal between me and my husband. And, like, spiritually, it makes me always remember that I'm like in a uh, relationship and like a union with someone else and something that it's a constant reminder and something spiritually that it just changed my life. When I got married it was a change that I made that was a physical change as well as like an emotional change. And maybe it's also just the state of mind is also a, a, a very important article of clothing and on that level well, that's just something to think about. I don't know. Why is it important that all of these Jews put on tefillin? Well, it's a, very, it's a commandment in the Torah and the Bible for all Jewish men to put tefillin every day, to bind the word of God to their hand and put it between their eyes, which that's next to the heart, next to the brain, that make up, makes us connected to God both emotionally and mentally. So that's what all these Jewish men are doing every day when they put on tefillin, whether they're doing it here or anywhere else. A lot of people have beards, but we have a special sign. These are uh, simonim, and these signs, re we remember exactly who we are and what is our destination in the world. And I decided actually when I was um, in the 11th grade to start to, to grow them, because I really wanted to look like my grandfather. My grandfather, Yosef Mansur, came from Yemen when he was 25, and he had this simonim, he still has them. So me and my brother together, we started, we decided to start to have this, to look like a like a real, real Jew. Peos in general, you're not, it only says you're not supposed to cut, shave them down. So I grow them out, it's like a heater mitzvah to make it look beautiful. And they say, you know, it says not to cut it, so now I'm not gonna shave it to the bare minimum, which is like shaving with a razor getting into the roots is like what you're not allowed to do. But to grow it out nice and long and like show it around how it's beautiful. And to serve God with that beauty, right? And guitar, I'm serving God with the beauty of music. You Come have on. a blue thread. Tell us about that. The blue thread, it's, it's, it's the trellet, actually. It reminds us when we see this, this blue thing, we remember the sky. Or remember the water, the sea, the ocean. And then we remember the sky. And then we remember Hashem. Hashem. That's the main thing. To always think. To always think about one, wherever you go. <laughs> Mitzvah gedola, lihiot besimcha, lihiot besimcha tami. Mitzvah gedola, lihiot besimcha. Mitzvah gedola, lihiot besimcha, lihiot besimcha tami. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you there. What's so exciting about tonight is we're not just reviving clothing, we're reviving mitzvahs. If you can imagine that for centuries upon centuries, Jews around the world have been keeping the commandment of tzitzis 
as just a commemoration. We've just been doing it and doing it and knowing that one day God would restore his commandments just like he promised, knowing that one day he would bring us back to where we are always meant to be. And now finally, after being back in the land of Israel, he's bringing our commandments back to us. And after centuries, we're now finally able to fulfill the commandment of tzitzit with a p'til t'chelet, with a turquoise wool. Now, our next guest, Dr. Ari Greenspan, he is a shochet, he's a moil and a sofer. A shochet is a ritual slaughterer, a moil is a ritual circumciser, and a sofer is a... Scribe. Scribe, a ritual scribe. Anyways, he has spent 20 years of his life going to far-flung places throughout the world, bringing Jewish traditions back to Israel that have gone everywhere. He's mind-expanding in the way he teaches and the way he speaks, and what I love about it so much is that he's my dentist. <laughs> there are times I go months without brushing my teeth just to accrue the cavities necessary to let him drill and tell me about his latest giraffe slaughtering or cricket souffle, whatever. Anyways, I'll let him tell you. Dr. Ari Greenspan, welcome. <laughs> so let's start, just give a little background. What is Tchelet? Okay, we have a commandment in the Torah that we should wear the fringes, the tzitzit. It's an unusual commandment in multiple ways. First of all, it's one of the few commandments that we can fulfill 365 days a year. Many things we can't, certain things we can't do on Shabbat. Secondly, the rabbis tell us that of all the commandments, it somehow reminds us of all of the mitzvot. It's equal to all the mitzvot. In fact, if we use the halachic Jewish uh, number game playing gematria, where each letter is assigned a number, tzitzit actually equals 613, which equals all the mitzvot in the Torah. The Torah tells us that one of those strings has to be a chut, a string of tchelet, some sort of a color, a blue, a blue color. Now, most people that wear tzitzit today, if you look at them, they're not wearing that tchelet string. And the real question is why? Uh, well, I could speak for four or five hours, and I know you told me that I have only three hours to speak. Okay, basically what happened was sometime around 1300 years ago, as the Jews went into exile, the tchelet color, the tradition disappeared. We know that Abaya, our great sage in the fifth century, had tchelet. We know that they tried to smuggle it to Babylon from Israel, and the reason they had to smuggle it to Babylon was because it comes from a snail that's in the Mediterranean Sea. A snail? Exclusively? Only from a snail. It was so valuable, it's hard for us to relate to. I mean, we just read it in the Torah. What did they use in the tabernacle in the wilderness? Gold, silver, copper, and in the next, sex, next sentence, tchelet, blue thread, argaman, a purple thread, tolat shani, some sort of a red thread. I mean, it's hard for us to relate to. How could threads be so valuable? Yet Aristotle tells us they're worth 20 times their weight in gold. And in some respects, they were the most valuable commodity of the ancient world. Why? Imagine a world where everything is dyed natural colors. None of this vibrant purple and blue that Ruvain has here. And the minute you dyed it with a natural grass color, it washed out. There were only three colors that were intense, beautiful, permanent, and vibrant. Tchelet Argaman and Tolat Shani. They were the colors of Malchut, of king, kingship. They were the colors of the priests, and that's why the high priest and the priest in the temple wore these colors, and that's why the kings wore the colors. Called royal blue. Where does royal blue come from? Because only the kings wore, the, wore these colors. So how do we know that this is the real tchelet? I mean, how do we know this is the right snail? How do we know it comes from snails? How do we know any of this? Okay, well, we know it from the Talmud. First of all, the Talmud's very clear. It talks about the snail. It describes the snail. We know that the Romans used the same thing. In fact, we know that the Romans sometimes killed us for using the snails. Not for what Ruvain mentioned earlier as a religious decree, but more as a social decree. At some point in the 5th century, in the 4th century, the emperors of Rome said, Wait a minute, this is too valuable. Only we in our court can wear this color. Anybody caught with it is put to death. So there's a beautiful story in the Talmud. Two people left the city of, the city of Reket. Reket was Tiveria when the, when the Sanhedrin, the great court was there. They had in their hands things made in the city of Luz. What were these things? Tchelet, says the Gemara. Yarad Hanesher Veratsala Hargam, the Roman eagle came down. Rashi says the soldiers wanted to kill them. Nasanes, some miracle happened, Vyatsulish Shalom. But we see in the time of the Talmud already, it was exceedingly valuable. It became rare, and sometime, probably give or take the eighth century, it disappeared. Jews no longer had it. We know that by the time of the Rambam 
And uh, a little bit after, we hear sentences in the rabbi saying things like, Zman Rav lo zacha ish b'Yisrael atil tchela b'gdo. Many, many, many years, we have not been um, zocha, how do you say it? Merit. Merit. Too many years in Israel. We haven't merited to wear this tchelet in our garment. Well, so now that we're finally merited to wear the tchelet in our garment, now that we finally reestablished a mitzvah in the Torah, is that a sign that we're close to the end? Is that it? Is the redemption on the horizon? Is the temple about to be built? I think it is, but you want the interesting story? Yes. Okay, the interesting story is how we found it. About 120 years ago, a great rabbi thought he needed to find Tchelet, the Redzina Rebbe, and he made a trip to Naples in Italy. And he comes to the first aquarium that ever existed, and he sees what he thought was the source of Tchelet. Took him a long time, he made some blue strings. Comes along Rev Herzog, the first chief rabbi of the state of Israel. He disagreed with him, and he suggested this family of snails. And about 15 years ago, together with three buddies, we decided to go looking for him. And we went scuba diving in the north of the country where the Talmud, the Gemara says, the snails exist. And we found them. It took us about a year to make the tchelet. But we made the tchelet from the original snails in a very authentic way. And it's an amazing thing. There were some chassidim in Meir Sharim that heard that we actually made it. And they felt that if it exists, that's actually part of the mitzvah. You're not allowed to wear regular tzitzit if you don't have it, at least according to their opinion. They stopped wearing their tzitzit until we could give them a pair of tchelet. Wow. So there's now a sect of Hasidim that now are being Mekayim the Mitzvah that weren't before? I mean, there are tens of thousands of people now that are being Mekayim the Mitzvah. I was just looking over at your band. You had a bunch of guys in the band wearing Tchelet. Or this guy. I mean, you can imagine the pleasure and the enjoyment that I have when I see you showing a video and there's a guy walking down the street that's wearing Tchelet and he's wearing the Tchelet that we make. Well, this is actually the way I just wanted to say goodbye because Ari Griza, he's been my dentist as well for, uh, since I was in 12. And what's so spectacular about the Jews in Israel is you can be an accountant and you can be a lawyer and you can be a dentist and be so involved in Judaism, so involved in the developments of Judaism, so connected to movements that are happening to the nation of Israel. And Dr. Greenspan, we wanted to thank you so much for being on the show. Keep it up. Thank you. Greenspan Dental. <laughs> GreenspanDental.com. <laughs> you, you know, our, our sages tell us that the Jews of Egypt were on the verge of assimilation, but they kept the Hebrew language, their Hebrew names, and their Hebrew garments, their Hebrew clothing, and that prevented them from losing their identities. You know, I remember gro growing up in Houston, Texas. At about the age of 15, I decided to take my religious level, my observance up a level, and I made a, a decision that I was going to wear a kippah. And I was a little nervous about it. I didn't know what the ramifications would be on a family level, on a, on a social level. But I took the leap. I took the plunge. And it was very interesting what happened. I was expecting, I'm from Texas, a lot of anti-Semitism. But really, none. There were a number of, of non-Jews who weren't familiar with it. And they would come up and say, hey, boy, is that a satellite on your head? <laughs> and I would explain to them what it is and engage in dialogue, which, of course, strengthened me more. But where the real problems came for me were with many of my friends, my friends from school. You see, m so many came to me and said, you know, we really respect your, your conviction on the issue. But when it came to going out on Saturday nights and I was wearing my kippah, many of them didn't really want to hang out with me because they felt that by associating with me, it was a stamp of Jew on them. And some of them just didn't want that. I mean, the majority of them stood by my side, but it was still a painful and isolating experience. And I remember wondering, Hashem, why is this so difficult on me when it's your will, when it's what you command me to do? And I don't have to look back too far to realize the answer to that. It's very clear. Hashem uses the mitzvot to build us up. And by wearing my kippah, I had the, the courage and the character to be different, to stand apart, to not necessarily accept the values and the priorities that were thrown at me. The courage to be different and take the road a little bit less traveled. The road less traveled that's brought me back to the land of Israel, a decision that I will always, always be grateful for. So I think as Jews around the world, perhaps tomorrow, we should make an effort to break through our comfort zones just a little bit, to take our Jewish garment up one level, to dress the Jewish part just a little bit more. If we never wear a kippah, take a kippah. Put it on just for the day. If you wear a kippah but you don't wear a tzitzit,
get a pair of TT and put it on. If you have TT and you wear it tucked in, tuck them out and wear them out strong and proud. Because if we as a nation, if we wear what is right, perhaps Hashem will allow us to do as a nation what is right. Shalom from Jerusalem. Get in the